because the word of God says that train up a child in the way he or she should go and when they are grown up when they are mature they will not depart from it so that is intentionality that you as a parent need to be deliberate and be focused uh, in terms of how you do your parenting and then also we are living in a stage and time when our children are not just being parented by us but they're also being parented by the social media uh, you may think that your child does not know much uh, but you'd be very surprised that the children that we are raising nowadays because of the power of the social media they have been exposed to so much they know quite a lot about life and sometimes some of the information that they have received is not the right information uh, some of the things they are trying to toy al around with or trying to practice with are things that they have been given by the wrong people i also mentioned uh, in my uh, presentation this morning that uh, we are also having quite a, a struggle with the children that are going to school nowadays probably as we think about uh, parenting in our present time is that the issues that our children are dealing with when they go to school probably are not the same kind of issues that you dealt with when you are going to school uh, they have a lot of fears they have a lot of issues that they are encountering and if you as a parent don't give ear to them and probably sit down and find out why is my daughter not wanting to go back to school uh, you'll discover there are things that are making your child not to want to go to school and so these are situations that we are encountering and then also unlike our parents during their days we find ourselves in a very challenging society you know so much pressure has been put on us as parents and so we find ourselves not being as available for our children the way probably our parents were for us and so again these are things that we may need to look into and just find out how can we as parents continue to do parenting in our age and time as we are talking about parenting in the 21st century my wife will later on as we mount up i think we will get to know and uh, just hear from her uh, she's a counseling psychologist one of the beauty about her being a supportive wife and uh, coming in to compliment me in ministry is that she deals with the uh, ladies and uh, more specifically uh, the lord has given her burden for widows and uh, for single parents and also she has this thing uh, just about working with young girls who have just been recently married again as i said in the morning uh, we have quite a number of these young families that are struggling really struggling seriously with marriage issues and i realized some of them is because of the background they came from and so i decided to just tweak my sharing today instead of us looking at the subject uh parenting in the 21st century let me talk about parenting all right the different types uh, of styles of parenting and the effect of that type of parenting style has on your child and it cuts across whichever level of parenting that you are doing whether you are dealing with the toddlers or you are dealing with the ones who are a little bit grown up or the ones now who have gotten into teenage and the ones now probably who are in university the then there is also another group now that are out of the university and they are looking for jobs they are trying to make their way into career uh, for the 31 day uh, years that we have been married i think we have almost gone through that cycle uh the cycle that now we are waiting for is to be called granddaddy and grandmommy 
And we are trusting God that our daughter and our son, one of these days, are going to help us to be privileged to enter into that uh, season of life. And so we can talk uh, with authority on matters to do with parenting. Let's begin by first of all underscoring uh, this is kind of marriages that we are talking about and uh, another parenting when it comes to and we can now go ahead uh, parenting there is a great deal of diversity amongst families different families do parenting differently and then there is also cultural backgrounds that have had a major impact on how family unit exists and how children are reared. As you go from one culture to another culture, you'll find people are given different orientation. They are exposed to different norms and traits. Some are exposed to taboos uh, and different ways in terms of how we have cultured our, ourselves. And so those are things that we can also bring up front. Even when it comes to marriage, we have realized that as we do marriage counseling, it depends on what culture somebody has come from. Because culture has a way of informing us how to relate to people and how to relate to situations, how to behave and how not to behave. And some of those cultural things, in as much as some of them are positive, but yet also we know that some of them are very, very negative. All right, so we want to just understand from that background that there is diversity in terms of how we run family. The other thing I also want to bring out is that every parent has a different approach on how to interact and guide their children. And uh, again, we are going to see some of the style that you apply has been uh, something that has come from your worldview, from the background of how you are raised up as a person. And whether you like it or not, the background that you came from, how your parents interacted with you, will play into how you behave with your children now. Yes or no? Oh, yes. Then another thing we also want to bring out is that a child's morals, principles, and conduct are generally established through a bond. Uh, the way your child behaves, the way they look at life, will be determined by how you are connected to your child. And they learn a lot on how to behave, how to relate to situations in life by our own interaction with them. So that is another thing that we want to put it very clearly. Another thing that I want to lay down as uh, my premise again is that different researchers have grouped parenting styles into three, others four, others five, or even more psychological constructs. Eh? But today we are going to be looking at one which uh, puts them into five uh, ways on how you can approach parenting. All right. In our study today, we will only focus, uh, did I say five or four? Four parenting uh, categories. And we are going to be looking at them under authoritarian, authoritative, permissive, and an uninvolved parenting. Every category, as we shall see, employs a certain unique approach to how parents raise their children. And by the way, this is research that has been done by people. So the kind of information I'm going to give you, I'm going to show you some of the places where I sourced some of this information. So uh, I'm not knowing it all, having it all. No, 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 no. There are people who have studied children. Like my wife, when she was doing her, her thesis, I think she went to study children and how they relate to bereavement and she was able to sample a certain number of children and uh, one of the things that has come out is sometimes when children are bereaved we tend to neglect them and we just deal with the daddy and mommy and forget that there are also children in that home who have been bereaved and of late, whenever we go with my wife, we have now changed our approach. We don't just deal with daddy and mommy. We also try to find out where are the children in this home. And we try to minister to them also. So we'll see that every category employs a unique approach on how parents raise their children. And generally that each parent will fall into one of these categories, sometimes have characteristics that cut across into another category. 
All right? And we are going to be looking at the four in a short while. Let us begin by looking at the authoritarian parenting. Authoritarian parenting or authoritarian parent. Now, parents of this style tend to have a one-way mode of communication where the parent establishes strict rules that the child must obey. You are the father, you are the mother, you listen. You don't tell me. It is me to tell you. That is authoritarian. And of course, the scriptures tell us that children should uh, learn to respect and honor us as parents. And therefore, we speak into their lives. Uh, but again, when we overdo it and we take it to another extreme where we neglect the needs and even the issues that the child might be going through simply because we want to be parent and we are always correct, we miss out on something. Here, there is no room for negotiations from the child. And the rules are not usually explained. You do, or you're, <laughs> you draw the line or <laughs> hit the road. Okay. Uh, this authoritarian parenting also, they expect their children to uphold these standards while making no errors. In other words, the child must follow everything that you have told them. And they should not question. They should just draw the line without any uh, fault. Again, the other thing there is that mistakes usually lead to punishment. If you fail, you are spanked, you are beaten. If I may use the African terminology, you know, when you talk about beating in uh, the uh, Western world, they will call on you 911, I'm telling you. In fact, parents who have gone to some of those places have come to discover that you cannot parent your children out there the way you parented them here. Uh, because that kagal or boy can call on you 911. Uh, or you can be taken to court because children have their rights. Even in school, a child cannot be just touched anyhow by the teacher. The child has got rights. And therefore, uh, you know, th that is authoritarian parenting. Authoritarian parents are normally less nurturing and have a high expectations with limited flexibility, okay? And as I was telling you earlier on in the service, what happens with such parents, sometimes you want to make your children perform to the level where they do not have an ability. Again, you'll find that children only can perform up to a certain level, up to a certain point. When you push them, you end up taking those children into mental illness. Because the expectation of daddy and mommy are beyond what I can manage. They want me to be number one, and I cannot get to number one. They want me to be good in mathematics, but that is not my talent. That is not the skill that I have. And I want to thank God for CBC that is now giving us opportunity to uh, venture into other areas of appraisal. So that we are not just looking at academics. Some of these guys are good in arts. You know, they can just do drama. They can sing. They can be able to write. Some others can be able to shoot like this guy is doing here. And, uh, you know, they may not go the way which you and me went by going up to university and you must do, I don't know which subject. No, 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 no. Our children nowadays, particularly the millennials and the Gen Z, you don't tell them. Uh, you guide them. Others, you lose them. And we have known parents who have forced their children to do certain things. And what happens? The child told you, Daddy, will you want to take a degree? Hi, and you're here. Sasa, leave me to go and do my, my own thing. You have lost that child. And they have lost a lot of time in between themselves. Like there's a good friend of mine, uh, you know, family friend. We have been talking with them. Their child is very good. He's a creative. I don't know that you know what we mean by creative, sir. Eh? Uh, that, that is the millennial la language. These guys who shoot and do films and what have you, and they are very good with social media. Now, those guys, they don't want any certificate. They only know the skill. <laughs> so this boy was in uh, university doing BCom. He got to third year. He told the daddy, me, I'm away. I'm gone. And the father and the son have been having loggerheads with one another because according to the father, I want you to get your BCom like I did when I was in the university. 
But the boy is telling the father, no, 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 me, I've got this skill. And the boy racks in good money, by the way. He, he goes from this event to the other event. He's on, on high demand. And he's doing well. But according to daddy, you must have what? A degree. Now, that is the Gen Z. Very difficult people to manage when it comes to career placements. And so if you are an authoritarian parent, you lose them. You lose them. Children grow up with authoritarian parents will usually be most well behaved in the room because the consequences of misbehaving. Now listen to this. Usually they will appear to be complying outwardly, but inwardly they are not doing what? They are not complying. Have you ever heard of this story of this boy who was taught, hey, sit down by the teacher. And uh, <laughs> the boy sat down, but he whispered to his friend, but I'm, also, uh, but I'm, I'm still standing, yeah. inwardly. So authoritarian parents, sometimes we lose it out. And that is the old way we were raised up. You know, you did ask any question, what you are told to eat, you eat, and you keep quiet. Where you are told to go, you go. But the generation that we are dealing with now, the millennials and the Gen Z, I wish I had more time I would open up so that we just look at this Gen Z and uh, millennial and the children that we are raising now. You'll find that it's a totally different ball game. Additionally, this authoritarian parenting are better able to adhere uh, rather, children from that particular uh, understanding, they are able to adhere to the precise instructions required to reach a goal. That is the good thing about it. Furthermore, this parenting style can result in children who have higher levels of aggression, but may be also shy, socially empt, and unable to make their own decisions. Because daddy and mommy always makes decisions for me. So when he's put or she's put on spot, on making a decision for themselves, what career do you want to take? It is, mommy must tell me, you know, daddy must tell me. And at the end of the day, they lose out on what we call personal initiative and uh, innovation because everything must come from daddy and mommy. Now, this aggression can also remain uncontrolled as they have difficult managing anger as they were are not provided with the proper guidelines. Again, some things you are just told don't do. You are not told why you should not do them. They have poor self-esteem, which further reinforces their inability to make decisions. Okay? And sometimes they operate under fear. These are the kind of children, they are all over the place doing everything in the house. Wait until daddy drives into the drive-in. Everybody's campus. They now take out their books. They are trying to read. They are trying to wash the dishes that they left in the morning in the kitchen. Because daddy and mommy has arrived. You see, that is the kind of impulsion you are making the children to believe. That it's only until daddy comes, that's when I can be responsible. It's only until mommy comes, that's when I can do certain things. And somehow we lose out on our children when we take them into that kind of a lifestyle. Strict parental rules and punishments often influence the child to rebel against authority figures as they grow older. And if you as a parent, you have not been able to see that the child has grown up, this is the kind of a child when you touch one time, they will tell you, mommy, we don't want to again. Oh, what is a kukujia? daddy, no, we don't want to say again. Can we sort it out now? Because you have not realized that they have grown up and they cannot be beaten or slapped the way you used to do it. Yeah. So they tend to run away or rebel against authority figures because they feel anybody who has been an authority in their life has limited them. So what are we saying? Authoritarian parenting spoils the child. It does not help the child. You know, engage with the child. And we are going to be seeing that later on. Uh, don't be too downhanded on them. Otherwise, you lose them. And I've put the source where I got some of that information there. 
let us go to the next type of parenting. We have seen there is authoritarian kind of parenting, but there is also authoritative parenting. Those are two different concepts. My wife was able to help me appreciate that some time back. Now, this type of parent normally develops a close, nurturing relationship with their children. They have clear guidelines for their expectations and explain their reasons associated with disciplinary action. Why am I getting these two strokes of cane? Why am I being told I am not going to go out? and I'm needing to be in the house. Why am I being told not to do A, B, C, D, not to go to certain places? There are reasons why you have given the child and therefore you are using your authority in a, in a firm way, but also in a way of helping the child. Now, disciplinary methods are used as a way of support instead of punishment. Disciplinary methods are used as a way of support instead of punishment. The other thing we can also say there is that not only can children have input into goals and expectations, but there are also frequent and appropriate levels of communication between the parent and the child. You sit down with them and ask them, so what choice of subjects do you want to do? And the child can tell you, you know, I'm good in the arts. Or they can tell you, I'm good with the sciences. Or they tell you, I feel that I want to become like this when I grow up. And so you help them choose the kind of subject combination that can take them to be the lawyer or the engineer or whichever person they want to become in life. There is a communication that goes on between you and your child. Or even when the child is looking for a school, I remember those days when it would come to class eight and you are looking for a school. Again, you sit down with your child and help them understand which places that they can be able to go to and which ones they cannot be able to go to. You reason together and arrive at an agreed place where the child may feel free to go. In general, this parenting style leads to healthiest outcome for children, but requires a lot of patience and effort on both parties. Because this is the child and you are the parent. And sometimes if you are not very careful, the child may be the one leading you instead of you leading the child. And as much as you have given him or her room to engage with you, they should also know that there are also limits to how much they can engage. So again, you want to balance and have an equilibrium in terms of how you assert yourself as a parent. The other thing about authoritative parenting, it results in children who are confident, who are responsible, and who are able to self-regulate. Now, when our son, who now, as we said, he's about 26 now, uh, he's a creative also, uh, when he was, uh, he had finished his uh, class eight, and apparently, when we were looking for Form 1 in Nairobi, I, we looked all over the place. We could not find a very decent or a presentable or a more uh, good school that we could take him. Because you go to this one, you are told this. You go to this other one, you are told this. You go to the other, you are told this. And particularly the boarding schools. And so we said, no, no, no. Let's try something else. And uh, there is, uh, some of you probably know about SCE, Accelerated Christian Education. So we decided to take him out of the 844 program and take him into the ACC program. And when my son landed in the SCE program, all of a sudden, all the things that were hidden in him just started coming out like this. The guy became a musician something that he would never probably have gotten into when he was with the 844, because 844, it is school, 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 no holiday, school, school, school. He had no time to develop a skill or a talent that was within him. He was a very good drummer and also very good on playing bass up to this day. The other thing also we discovered about him is a guy who wants to be self-regulating. 
Uh, when you talk too much on him, you lose him. And then he has his own pace on how to do things. And that is one of the things that they do in the ACE program. It is a student-oriented type of education system where when they are sitting in a class, they are not sitting in a class competing with one another. Everybody learns at their own pace. They actually have what they call a learning center. And within the learning center, the child can be able to be developed in every subject at their own pace. They don't go competing at who was number one, who was number uh, Every child moves at their own pace. And when we took our child to that program, all of a sudden, this guy who was shy and quiet like this, whoosh, he started blossoming. To the point where when he finished his program, he is the one who told us what he wants to go and do. And before we knew it, he was already in college because they go online and they look for these schools. He got a very good uh, school where they can go and learn about uh, sound production. And uh, he did sound production. He actually did his internship at Hope FM. Before later on, again, he went on to the online. He discovered there is a very good school at Cape Town, which can now help him to grow and develop himself. My wife and I, we had tried to take him to uh, USIU, <laughs> and we found that the USIU people could not take him straight because of the program that he was doing with the SEE. They were not taking them there straight. So we took him to Riara for one, Riara University for one uh, semester. And the guy said, you fellows, forget about this place. You're wasting your money. I don't want to go back there. And he had already gone online and already applied to a school in Cape Town. And he told us, me, I've found a school. And my, my wife and authoritative. I would rather we develop an authoritative type of parenting style and not the authoritarian, which most of us were raised up with. Because those days, even in school, Ukicheza when I was six by the head teacher. And I used to pride myself. You know me, I was a very good fellow when I was in school. I never went to the head teacher's office to be given six. I used to just hear stories of how people, when you go there, that head teacher, akikupatia sita kwenye nanyo. Pali, eh? Yeah. Anyway, we are, we are there. No, number three, because I need to allow us now to get into discussions because I know that's where the juicy stuff is, is permissive parenting. What is permissive parenting? Permissive parents tend to be warm, nurturing, and usually have minimal or no expectations. They impose limited rules on their children. Communication remains open, but parents allow their children to figure things out for themselves. Are you already sensing something dangerous there? Eh? Yeah, in other words, it's almost like laser fear. Oh, girl, what do you want? Oh, you oh, can get it. Oh, boy, you wanted to go where? Oh, you can go. No, no, no. That is permissiveness, but not with good controls. Let's continue here. These low levels of expectation usually result in rare uses of discipline. Because you don't want to make your child uh, have a problem with you, or you don't want to put pain on your child. In fact, if the child has a problem in school, you end up blaming the teacher instead of finding out what exactly your boy or your child did. You know, sometimes as parents, we go to the wrong side of discipline, all right? Or in a case where it is in the home, where you find you are two parents, but you don't have an understanding of how to punish your children. Sometimes when the children know that, they play games around you. Because they know in certain things, daddy says yes. In certain things, daddy says, no, 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 mommy says no. And so they know when to go to daddy and when to go to mommy. They act more like friends than parents. Limited rules can lead to children with unhealthy eating habits because they can eat in the, in, in the, in the bedroom. Uh, they, they, they can eat walking all over the place. People should know there is discipline. Hey, there is etiquette. People must sit at the table so that they can learn how to relate with other people. Somebody say amen to that. But these Gen Z guys and the millennial, those guys don't know anything about the easy, easy mesa to melete, easy round tables. Those are all useless to these guys. They would rather be playing their game or watching whatever they are watching on whichever screen and eating at the same time. 
And then they have this habit where, you know, they have no responsibility. You know, it is the house help who has to clean up after them. Even some things that are very obvious, including even making their beds. They cannot make their beds. And yet they are going to sleep in that same bed. They don't even know how to clean up themselves. Sometimes, if you're not very careful, that fellow can stay a whole week in Ata Jengia Oh, yeah. Like again, another, <laughs> another family that I was involved in, this uh, young man had got married to this young lady. And uh, apparently there were people connected with me, so somehow I was part of the preparing them in terms of premarital. But I didn't know much about the girl. I knew about the young man because we were related somehow, but though distance. So they got married, and believe you me, it didn't, it didn't take long, that marriage collapsed. And three times I tried to bring them to my office to talk, I realized, ah, hapa kuna shida ya upbringing. Because the man said, Pastor, you know, you're, I'm trying to be a bit uh, diplomatic with you. But this, my wife now, doesn't, doesn't wash, does, does, doesn't, does, doesn't, doesn't bath. Yes, yeah, seriously. She doesn't bath. And much of her life is in the bedroom. She doesn't come here, uko kwa sitting room. Hako tu kwa hii mtandao yako, papa, papa, papa. And then the other thing again also, the man, he, he's struggling there, he's, he's hungry. Hash is the type of, you know, K, KFC, and I know that huko kutoka huko. The girl does not know how to cook. Parents, we are spoiling these children. We are spoiling these children. Sometimes be very firm with them. Tell them you must clean up. You must go and know where these things are done. What will happen when you're not there? So I found that there was a big problem with this marriage because this girl, I think, she never touched anything in the kitchen. And then sometimes I even wonder, how do they even wash with this kind of... Fivefold ministry. <laughs> They don't eat ugali now. And everything is KFC. You know, there is now, what do you call it, boat nowadays. They can bring it for you. Uber can bring the food. And then now also these, what do you call them? These are our big uh, supermarkets now. The food is all laid out there. You just go and pakua and you have dinner. Uh, let us help our children. We, we, we will miss them. If we have this kind of permissive parenting, what happens is that when these guys come into the place of responsibility, they don't know how to behave. Atam to a Jew how to handle a man. A Jew how to handle a lady. This is my wife. She keeps on bleeding. What was wrong with her? <laughs> oh, some of you didn't catch the praying. Hana Bari, Hana Bari. He does not know the biology of a woman. <laughs> so limited rules can lead children with unhealthy eating habits, and especially regarding things like snacks. They just keep on eating, eating snacks, and they keep on growing like this. If you go to the United States, you find people who are like this. They even go to the supermarket. They cannot walk because they just eat, 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 eat. Junk, 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 junk. Mm. Please don't raise up children like those. The child also has a lot of freedom as they decide their own bedtime, if or when to do homework, and screen time with the computer and television. You have no control over that. And as parents, please, let us get into some of this private world of our children. Let us put the necessary security in some of these gadgets, because some of them, you may think they are watching a movie, Kumbe, they are busy on porno, uh, heavy pornography. You know, others are just doing crazy things that you never want to even imagine that they are doing with these gadgets. And then freedom, to this degree, can lead to other negative habits, as the parent does not provide much guidance on moderation. 
Yeah. What the child wants, give. What the child wants, gives. And sometimes you find some of those parents who I even sympathize with when the children are with them in the supermarket and they are throwing tantrums. Oh my goodness. Yeah. He has put the mother where? On the finger like this. And I'm twisting my there if it I feel I should not throw tantrums like that. Unamwek hapa unamutandika. Then I'm in front of people so that he can know this business will find him just happen to me. So permissive parenting dangerous. It's good to allow our children a certain level of freedom, but when again we take it to the extreme, we are spoiling those children. Yeah, let us limit even the time they are on the gadgets. Even when they're on holiday, they should not just be with them throughout. You can tell them, okay, between this time and this time. I remember our days when we were growing up. I'm telling you. And you are told it's only grown-ups who are going to remain in the sitting room. So you have to go to watch black and white TV. Yeah. Yeah. No debating about it. Adult stuff for adults only. Overall, children of permissive parents usually have some self-esteem uh, and decent social skills. Somehow, they still have some self-esteem because they are allowed to do what they want to do. And sometimes they could also have some certain decent skills because of also being able to have wider uh, experience and um, they are able to explore and see what is happening around them. There are some of you mejenga ukuta kama ile nilienda huko Bethlehem nikaona wamejengewa wale Palestinians and they cannot go out. Okay? Uh, unaweka ukuta namna hii at unajaribu kulinda huyo msichana. Wait until ataenda university. Where will you be? Mm. And you know what happens is that some people take advantage of those kind of innocent, naive people. While our jajua life, wanapata huko kuna vijana wengine who just expose them to certain things. And before you know it, that innocent looking boy or girl of yours has gone from you. However, they can be impulsive, demanding, selfish, and lack self-regulation, which are very key things for personal discipline and uh, integrity. Let's move on. The next level is an uninvolved parenting. An involved parenting. Children are given a lot of freedom as this type of parent normally stays out of the way. And particularly this is happening with some of us who have kind of delegated and relegated every of our responsibility to auntie. Everything is auntie. Everything is auntie. And you have gotten to a place where you don't even know what is happening at home. Because I'm busy. I, I, I'm a career woman. Or I'm a career man. But you don't have any idea what is going on at the home front. They fulfill the child's basic needs while generally remaining detached from the child. Those guys are taken to schools where they pay 250,000 per term. They have a chauffeur who drives them. Hata kuna wengine kutoka huko na nyuki wana kujanga na mahelikopter pa 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 turi. Said Andrews, turi. Mbesha yikuwa na yo. The number of motor vehicles is fewer than the helicopters that, that are parking. Some of you are quite exposed to your life. Oh, yes. Uh, the children have more pocket money than some of the salary some of us own. That's when I should know that I don't have any We spoil them. They fulfill the child's basic needs while generally remaining detached from the child's life. An uninvolved parent does not utilize a particular disciplining style and has a limited amount of communication with the child. So long as the child is being taken care of by the driver or is taken care of by the saloonists when they want to go and make their hair or want to do whatever, 
everything is okay. So long as they are going to those super schools where they can get the best education, I have nothing to do with them. Because tomorrow I'm in New York, the next day I'm in, you know, in, uh, in Dubai, and the other one I'm in Brisbane. I have no time for my children. Sometimes I usually like to just be very frank with people. There are some of these careers that we have chosen in life which are anti-family. And you must choose whether you want to sustain your career in that way or keep your family. And you must make very hard choices at some point. And I've known people sometimes who have even left certain careers so that they can be available to raise up a family. And God has given us this responsibility as parents. We cannot delegate it. Nobody else can be the mother to your child. Nobody else can be a father to your son. They need you. They want to emulate you. They want to learn life from you. And so if you are not there, what you are denying this boy or girl is opportunity to grow up in a wholesome way. They tend to offer a low amount of nurturing while having either few or no expectations of their children because they know children are already taken care of. The children of uninvolved parents usually are resilient and may even be more self-sufficient than children with other types of upbringing. However, these skills are developed out of necessity. It's like you have been thrown into the deep end and somehow you must learn how to do it, to swim. And sometimes some of these children, they don't know. They cannot make any rational decisions for themselves. That's why you as the parent need to be there to guide and to direct them. And if you are not guiding them, then other people are guiding them. And what normally happens, they get their guidance from their peers. It is what their peers are doing, is what their peers are wearing, is what their peers are driving, is what their peers, what their peers, what their peers are doing. And sometimes at some point uh, of their upbringing, you find that such children, it is the authority in their life is their peers rather than yourself. And for some of them, it's really the social media, what is trending in the social media, not even you, because they believe you are a dinosaur. You don't know social media. But when you know, hata sisi pia tubesha ingia uko social media, tunajua hii mambo. But they look at us as people who are limited with knowledge and understanding because for them it is here. Kwisha, kwisha. But for us, we have to rationalize, work through it, labor over hours. Like another Gen Z, when we were having our uh, cultural uh, influencers, we, we had um, a training uh, for those of us who are normally on hope. So not, not hope, um, what we call church online. And we had this young boy who came to talk to us about the Gen Z. Half of what he said, I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> hey, these guys are so much into the social media that I was not understanding what he's saying. And that's why they do very well with these jobs where they work at home. Uh, they do well with the jobs of working at home. And like one of them, as she was telling us around the table, you guys have to work between 8 and 5 o'clock. For how many hours? 8. Why should I go in a place where I'm crumbled into an 8-hour period, and yet I can do that same work in 2 hours? And finish. And they're done. Sisi lazima uingie clock in at 8, clock out at 5. Yeah. But our jamaa waneza kufanya the same job within Alafu wa mingi kitu ingine sijui netwa sijui nini chat. Who knows about this chat thing? You just put in information and the thing gives you everything. That's how even they are writing their papers nowadays. If you want to write on anything, you just feed that thing and it gives you all the sources and all the statistics that you need to know about anything on this planet Earth. Ah. Hey, what is this now you're talking about? Because half of what you were saying, I could not understand. But that is the world that you and me find ourselves in. Additionally, we are looking at an involved parent. They might have trouble controlling their emotions, less effective coping uh, strategies, and may have academic challenges and difficult with maintaining or nurturing social relationships because they are completely detached from the realities of life. 
Everything has been given to them. And some of them, as I said, now when they are getting into a stage where they want to get married, they, they, they cannot make a good wife or a good husband because they have not been nurtured to the place where they can be responsible enough even to make a decision. And that is why when you talk to the Gen Z and the millennials now, particularly the, the millennials, uh, and you are trying to counsel with them, they have this uh, common phrase, I did not sign up for, for this. I, for them, marriage is about signing up. And then it has come also with a lot of force from other ideologies from out there that if I cannot keep up with you, we do it. We just go our separate ways. That's why for them, this thing, when we say, till death do us apart, they wonder, what, till death do us apart, what? What is that? They don't understand that language that you and me are able to relate with. For them, if I cannot be able to keep up with you, you just walk away. I go do your own thing, I do my own thing. And I start up with somebody else or with something else. So it's a very interesting time that we are living in, in terms of the 21st century, but those are the children. So in conclusion, what are we saying? Characteristics of a parent's upbringing style may continue to be prevalent in the child's behaviors and action as they age. In other words, as father, like, like father, like, like son, yeah. Yeah, the way you dress, the way you relate to life, you know, you'll find that this thing intuitively goes down onto your children. That DNA just goes down there. That's why I was saying when you are trying to, you know, talk to this child and telling them how you want them to be where and wherever, and you, you know, that is not your DNA. And that is the DNA that you have passed on to this child. I think you are just, you know, doing the wrong thing in terms of parenting. As a child grows older, they can be affected by other factors that further shape their conduct or possibly change it entirely. Like if we take them through therapy or when they are exposed to certain subcultures or when they go into jobs or other social circles, what happens is that they are able to somehow blend and change for those who would want to, but many of them will lose them because of poor parenting style. That brings me then to the question and answer session. I will, I will be sensitive about time. Uh, this is an area we really, really have forgotten about. I see you trying to see me. You are seeing him better for obvious reasons, but I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Just starting on, he, he talked about the uninvolved parent. I was counseling with a young girl who was in a relationship, and she's from a single mother. They don't have a relationship. In fact, when we were talking, the mother had just been to hospital. She was operated on a very major um, uh, operation, surgery, but she had no idea. She overheard it from her auntie, the mother's sister. One time she decided to do something to see if mommy will at least show some. She's born again, thank God. She drank herself silly and then came home. The mother just looked at her. She didn't tell her anything. Up to five years later, she had never talked about it. Whether she comes home or she doesn't come, it is okay. They have no relationship whatsoever. That is how dangerous that gate. That was just to add on to that one of an involved uh, parent. I wanted to talk very briefly about children and grief because children are so ignored when it comes to grief. You know, it doesn't show on their faces. No. Shop is talking, it's okay. <laughs> they don't know how uh, to show it on their faces. They don't know how to express it in words, so they act up. The small ones, toddlers, zero to two years, they still feel the loss, but they don't understand anything. So they will be clingy, 
they will cry. If they had learned potty training, they will stop and regress, start bedwetting again and soiling themselves. Around three to four years, they have an idea because they've seen a fly die, a cockroach, maybe a bird, a pet, but they don't know the permanency of death. You know, in the cartoon world, Tom and Jerry, Tom can be run over by a car, he becomes flat, but he will come up again. <laughs> so even when somebody very close has died, they don't know that that is forever. And the mistake adults do is to tell them, oh, he has gone to be with Jesus. But you don't make them understand that this parent or brother or sister is never coming back again. Very hard truth, but very important. In fact, most of us, in the, we think we are helping them by postponing or hiding the pain from them. There are parents who have told their children that their father went to the U.S. And they have never known that the parent died. They went home, up country, buried, and came back, and life continued. You don't even involve them. You just come with black and white clothes, heap them on them and say you're holding them and walking with them, going to church. Then you tell them, read here. You make them practice how they'll read the verse. They read and people even clap for them and then they go and say, but they don't know what is happening. Tell them, daddy or whoever has gone, they will not come back. Please don't be spiritual about it. Atisha is going to be with Jesus. Then they say, so when are we going to be with Jesus? They also want to go and be with Jesus. It is cruel, it is hard, but tell them the hard truth. Yes, they have Jesus, but they are not coming back again. We will never see them again. Involve them in the arrangements. Tell them, when we go to church, we will ask you to read this because the pastor will be preaching and ABCD. Let them know, to, depending on their age, their involvement. Let them know that when we go up country, daddy will be in a box, even if they're not viewing. And most of us don't want to see because we think that we will help them not grieve or that we will kill the pain as it were. Recently, we lost her niece and she left children. And I kept asking each one of them, do you want to go and see? And they would say, no, no, no. So they all said no. But one who is about six later on told me, please, can I go and see? So I carried her and showed her. And I think she relaxed. And I told her, mommy will not move again. Mommy will not come back home again. I think her closure may be better. Culture and the society will tell us, don't let children see dead bodies. That is not a dead body. That is mommy. That is daddy. There is some way of closure. This is not about the Luya, Luo, or Kalenjin thing. This is reality. I know some will get afraid and so on. If they don't want to see, don't force them. But let them be involved. Tell them when we go up country, there will be a grave and we put daddy wherever there and they will not come out of there. Because if we leave their body, it will, it will rot and it will not smell well. That's why we are put. Explain things. When you don't know, please know. Don't pretend to know everything. Don't cry. And when they come, you quickly wipe their t your tears. You know what that will do? They will never tell you how they are feeling. They will never cry. They will, they will never cry in front of you. They will be taking care of you the way you are taking care of them. So if you, they find you crying, they too will wipe their tears and they will not express their grief in front of you. Children five and above, they say six or five and above, depending on the relationship, have an idea of the permanency of loss and grief and death because they've seen their pets die and their mini when they're going to mommy's burial but they are deeply hurting. There was one we had, uh, we were having the mother's funeral in Sitam Karen, and this girl was looking sharp, very nice. But as soon as she got 
to the coffin, she collapsed for a long time. She had been doing this thing. You know, their peers don't know about death, so they don't know how to behave. They don't know how to be sad. They don't know how, they don't know how to handle tears. So you have to keep up and look like you're with it. And you're deeply, deeply hurting. Take care of teenagers. It will never show. They will look very nice. The children will still hop on one leg as they cry. They cry to, right now, and then they hop, and then they play, and then they come back and cry, and you think they are okay. They are not okay. They are deeply, deeply grieving. Even the toddlers, just cuddle them. Just hold them. Just allow them to be a nuisance once in a while to cry. Because they don't even know why they are crying, but they are feeling the loss. If we don't take care of children in grief, they, be, they can't handle relationships, they can't handle marriage, can't be good parents. God bless you. Come on, we stop. They'll never see them in school again. So they have an idea. When they ask questions, please answer. If you cannot answer, let somebody else come and answer those questions to you. And when it has happened, take them, put them somewhere and explain, this is what has befallen us as a family. So and so has died and they will not come back again. Yes, they've gone to be with Jesus because they've died. We can only go to be with Jesus when we die, but they will not. The most important thing is tell them this person is not coming back again. I know I sound like it's crazy, but that is the reality. Are they going to see daddy again? Are they going to see mommy again? Are they going to see the teacher again? No. So let them know in the kindest way you can do. But most of the time they'll regress, they'll act up, the boys will start beating everyone, the girls will become clingy, they will uh, don't want to go to school, they may not eat well, some lose weight, some have disturbances, some are totally afraid, so afraid. So as grown-ups, we need to come alongside them, hold them, you know, talk to them, tell them even me, I feel really bad, but with time we will get better. Just be as open as you can. Don't be graphic and make it look like the world has come to an end, but speak the truth and cuddle them and love them. Mommy, if it is daddy who has gone, let your children see you cry, it's okay. You're not a weak one. You're feeling the pain. If they find you, just say, Mommy, are you crying? Because even if you say no, they know that. So just tell them, I'm feeling very bad. I'm feeling, I'm missing so and so. That is why I'm crying. They will also cry. And when they feel bad, they will come and tell you, please, let's take care of children. When we don't involve them, they grow up as very, very angry citizens. They're those uh, teenagers also, they look like they don't care. They look like everything is okay. They'll still put on their 